Ah. Oh no, it's being recorded. All right. Um, and since these uh, program meetings now also show up in Data Tracker, we have official notepads and everything. So I'll drop that in our WebEx chat here. And I'll take notes in there, of course, as we discuss. Um, well, so, yes, please, David. Oh, no, no. I was just going to rant about the uh, WebEx chat warning me that I'm leaving WebEx. Like, when do you ever click a WebEx link to go to another WebEx? That is not what the link feature is for. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. That's pretty funny. Um, very good point. All right. So, welcome to EDM. I don't, uh, we haven't met for a little bit and I think we will be planning on meeting again at 116, but Dave and I thought it'd be good to have a chat with people now. Um, so I guess first off, uh, thanks Martin and David for taking protocol maintenance uh, to, to the finish line here. I, I, it's been a long road on that one, but um, yeah, appreciate all the back and forth and editing and working on incorporating community feedback. So much appreciated there. <laughs> yeah, that took uh, quite a bit of time and energy, but I'm really happy with the way the document ended up. Um, so, yeah. We'll see. There are, so, there are still some people unhappy and that's, I think that's, that's like a good outcome, unfortunately. Right. It is partly the nature of it. If everyone agreed, it would have been a waste of time to have written this. Right. Uh, so, yeah, thank you for that. Um, so, for the agenda for today, what I was pro proposing we talk about is one of the parts that in, you know, deployability and maintainability that we've talked about um, that the user to lose it draft talks about um, as greasing and in previous calls we've uh, alluded to a couple different questions here but I wanted to spend a bit more time digging in um, and particularly just you know to set some of the stage and the questions it'd be nice to um, answer is like we've often in the past said that you know we're greasing and it's you know, something of an experiment where we are learning uh, how effective it actually is. And we, you know, um, as far as I know, you know, TLS was the first instance of explicitly doing this in a protocol and calling it Greece. And that was done for very particular reasons uh, to, you know, avoid uh, perpetuating brokenness. But we are starting to do it in new protocols. Um, you know, Quick has had it baked in there are, um, you know, we're trying to add it into privacy pass as those documents are being defined. So, you know, one question is, are we aware of other places where we are using greasing? Um, and I know there was a discussion we had previously on the GitHub about, you know, when does it make sense to do greasing from the start of a protocol in the design, uh, as opposed to, you know, adding it into an existing protocol. But the real thing I'd love to get to is you know at what point if we say this is something where we're learning if it's actually effective and how it works how are we learning that how are we measuring if it actually works and if you know i assume we can't say anything like as an iab document now i'm like this is how increasing works and this is the right thing to do but when will we be able to say that and what are we learning from it so those are our thoughts have at it And it strikes me that the the instances where we we could have used some greasing, uh, we haven't had them, and we've seen some protocols sort of atrophy in in interesting ways. Uh, HTTP two is a is a great example of where we I think we knew about greasing 
at the time we built it and we didn't put it in. Um, it was too new at the time, the, the concept. And since we've discovered that it's just not extensible anymore in a couple of places. And that's kind of disappointing given how new that protocol is. But uh, that's how things work apparently. What are some of the concrete examples um, of the places where you've already seen H2? So you are supposed to ignore frames that you don't understand, uh, but that will often cause connection termination if you send something. So places where you might have decided your extension was, was simply, I'll just send a frame. Uh, you you have to negotiate that with settings. And I, I believe that the settings work. And it's kind of a, another testament to use it or lose it. Because <laughs> uh, it was being used and people are putting other new stuff in there. So that's... So, but was to... it the essence of the of the document that we just published or about to publish that it's actually better to kind of use the extension points you define rather than having... Uh, kind of artificial mechanism like we think. Yeah, I think I think the problem there was that we didn't have a whole lot of active use or active need for new stuff to be used in the frames context, whereas the the settings were, you know, a few things popped up over time pretty quickly, and and so there was active use on the settings, so so we we really didn't need to grease that, but then um, and and that's potentially a lesson for people doing greasing in that, you know, in quick, for instance, we probably didn't need to grease the transport parameters because they're seeing like active use on an ongoing basis with like people on this call throwing stuff in there like every other week. Fun, fun story. Uh, back in the early days of interop for quick, uh, Apple had a bug where they crashed if you sent them a transport parameter they didn't know. Uh, guess how I found out? Because <laughs> Google was like, oh, we so, have this all this gqueek stuff. Let's just shove it into a transport parameter. <laughs> so, but, so, but to Martin's point, that would have been caught pretty quickly anyway, regardless of greasing, once you know, we tested any of the yeah. other extensions. No, no, no. That's my so, point is we long. caught this not because of greasing, because I was using it for something. And mm. that's actually... That that's what triggered me to follow the issue and someone to add greasing or probably Martin to add greasing code points to the transport parameters was that blowing up, um, which still good to have greasing. But I agree. Uh, in some cases, just making sure there you really get use makes life easier. So so in in one place, two places that it would have been really nice to have greasing decades ago is in IPv6 extension headers. Um, and like we've essentially written ourselves into a corner, painted ourselves into a corner with that. Um, and I wish we had described in Six Man a decade ago when we went through that. We had we had this document. We had described it as greasing to keep these ASIC guys honest. Um, and the other side, uh, which we still don't have a good thing, is TCP options. We still have banks that will drop them just totally thing and they drop them because of default configurations for firewalls which are now um wrong but are somehow been painted into stone um and there's no reason for it like like just say no if you don't like that option just say no it's okay right um and um and but they don't they they they're they're just being too silly about it okay and i and i think it's a um i i i think it's um um, it's a fake security process that they go through where they think, oh, we should know everything about everything. And therefore, anything that's that's el that's new must be bad um, rather than thinking, no, I should be suspicious. But that doesn't mean I should drop the connection. And I think that that's a that's a really big difference. And it would be nice to talk more about greasing. Um, I'm going to say outside of the http world um so, but i don't think greasing would help in the tcp case because the reason they drop it is because they can right they can drop it and it doesn't have any consequences so it's the easy no they drop way. the whole connection i mean it depends like there are some middle bit boxes who just remove the option okay that's fine if you want to remove the option 
So, but but no, there are, there are banking even, websites. That makes it even harder <laughs> to some there, extent to deploy new options. But there are That's banking good. websites that drop the connection. It's a bad connection, which means okay. the only way to connect to your bank at that point is to somehow figure out how to turn off that new option that someone wants to deploy. And sometimes that's really impossible. That's very okay, difficult. So that, and then that's we, more problematic, but I still don't think that greasing would solve the problem because like then we would just drop more often. If they think that's a security feature, right? They would still implement it even if you have greasing. Well, they wouldn't be able to if like a third of all connections from all clients had this. I mean, they, they couldn't just say like all of our things are gonna fail. Now they may strip all of the options and then you know, you can't negotiate that option, but at least they wouldn't block connections. But that, but that's okay. It's okay. It's, it's okay to say no, right? I don't like your option. I don't know what it means. I'm not going to echo it back. I, I'm whatever. That's exactly yeah. how the extension mechanism is supposed to work usually, right? At that level. Well, and, and actually, so, Michael, are you referring to the behavior of, like, the firewalls that the connections are transiting through or the actual endpoints themselves? It, it actually doesn't really matter which end is intolerant to it, right? If if well, if they don't want to do if they don't want to negotiate TCP big window option, okay, and they decide to remove that at their firewall, that's fine or their middle box, okay. Yeah. And yeah. and if their endpoint doesn't know how to negotiate TCP big window or whatever it was called option, okay, and they say, oh, we're just not going to process it, that's fine. I don't care which way they which which point. But what they did was said, oh, this is a bad packet. I'm dropping it. Right? So you get nothing. And and that's the, the the problem. And they don't, like, oh, but it works with Internet Explorer and Windows 95 when we tested it 20 years ago. So it must be okay. Right? And then you're like, well, but, you know. And, and at one point, you know, we had an ECN. We tried to have an ECN wall of shame, right? And it, it, it didn't work that well. Okay? Um, but... Um, and it sure prevented us from deploying ECN by at least 10 years, I would say, uh, because we couldn't properly get people to, you know, tolerate it, let alone participate, right? So anyway, I just saying that I think that we kind of need a um, greasing is good roadshow and it needs to get outside the IETF. And we need to explain to, to the security, prof quote, professionals, unquote, why it is that they're they're actually harming themselves doing this? Yes, exactly. Thank you for the air quotes. I could turn on my video, but yeah, um, that's all I'm saying. So I, I think it's really great that this is all out, and I just think we need to go we need to go a little one step further in marketing of this, you know, concept, right? Um, the people like walking around with like oil cans. Thanks, everybody. Um, going back to one of the questions I had at the start, so as we mentioned some of the protocols that could have greased and didn't, or existed before we talked about greasing and probably would have benefited. Are there, so, you know, TLS, quick, the general open privacy pass, are there others that are actively greasing or protocols that are baking it in at this point? Uh, capsules. Capsules, yeah. Great. I just said capsules and Lucas showed up. Ha, it worked. Wow. You don't even need to say it three times. Yeah. Or you just need to say it once. It's I was, was going to say, I was going to ask Michael if there's anything in the um, in, in the space of IoT protocols like co-op and whatnot that have Adopted well, that would be area. a really good place. We could easily do greasing, um, and the option fields are very, very, uh, I don't want to say rich, but easy to do. Um, and what's also interesting is you might know co-op options are um, like they're not one, two, three. They're four plus the last one, six plus the last one. And so you could easily have some interesting greasing options that, you know, would split up things so that it's no longer quite the same. Uh, thing, but you always put the options in order of incrementing value. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is uh, encoding. This is an encoding uh, efficiency, and that's something. Yeah, I actually think we should put a. We should have some something in there. Ike v two 
it'd be nice to, to finally put something in that uh to do that yeah. kind of stuff um, that'd be a really easy one to just add yeah add so many layers like the you can do in transforms and attributes in the actual um message yeah yeah and 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 also just here's a really big fat option that causes the packet to fragment yeah yeah right um and, and then. you know now and then you put that in that would be interesting but you know. do, you, do you want a guarantee failure for those i mean well a lot of these these protocols don't handle that very well well that's the the, the point here is 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 to identify it in testing when people are doing things to cause them to go oh you know what it i mean that's the whole point it it doesn't work uh our new upgrade doesn't work with 97 percent of the apple devices out there oops what did we do wrong right but, but michael you, you don't want to see how bad my uh, fragmentation retransmission for ike strategy is it's, i know it's i know i know it's, it's 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 a thing but but the point is here the point here is that that this is again this is the point it, it, uh this is caused by people doing stupid things in the network that are intolerant of of things and yeah. assuming that because it worked last week it's going to work next week right yeah so the the problem here i think is that these are applications that are often quite sensitive to performance problems so you wouldn't want to do this very often but um that leads to the next problem which is that most of the time you're not doing this so people aren't encountering the the sort of unusual behavior. And then when it happens, it's like, oh, there's a transient failure. We'll just ignore that. So uh, one of the things I wanted to write in Ike V1 back 20 years ago, um, I wanted to actually have a button that was do interop, right? Um, which would actually propose a known uh, uh, set of uh, uh, traffic selectors with uh, a known set of algorithms and even get this a known pre-shared key across the network. And the whole point of, and the result would be a useless connection. However, it would validate the fact that the packets got there and got back, right? And that would allow you to keep doing the network test until you figured out, oh, I figured out what firewall is, is, is breaking the connection, right? And Paul Hoffman thought it was a terrible idea. Oh my goodness, because someone's gonna gonna code it as if it's a real thing and is gonna use it with for the real thing. Is it? Well, yeah. If they're that stupid, then yeah, of course that could happen. Um, but on the other hand, the rest of us are left with, I have no way to debug the other 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 version uh, at all because I can't get at the logs, I can't turn on debugging, and I can't do anything. And so let's install OpenVPN, right? Um, and that's how we have 20 years. We have, we have no good, in, no test this thing option. I mean, even I, I was helping a, um, a, a somewhat related thing. I was helping a friend who runs a pub to get her wireless to work so she could actually get, you know, her, her credit card terminal to work at the far end of her patio. Right. So what we're doing, we're setting up, you know, Wi-Fi extenders and this and that. They weren't working right. And the only way she had to test it was to put a card, her card into it and debit a dollar. There was no button on the stupid little terminal that said, please just check if my connection is alive. Right? It was just, there was like, no one had thought about this. I'm like, come on, really? I mean, just give me a button that does, me, does an HTTP ping or an HTTPS ping to the credit card clearinghouse and let me know if it's alive. Instead, she had to, you know, debit a dollar, at, refund it, debit a dollar, refund it. It was, you know, we did that 27 times or something before we got it working. But I mean, it's just like, really, no testing, right? And, and that's the same kind of thing that we need. And this is where the, the, the greasing comes in. It's like, test it with greasing, right? Here's the connection. Okay, minimal works. Okay, give me the Christmas tree packet. Oh, it fails. And if I could do that with every product, in the Ike space, we would have we would solve problems so much faster, right? Um, anyway, oh, although I, mean, I guess to what Mara was saying earlier about you know, I'm doing this very often, I, I could do that when I'm building the product and find the interrupt there when I know I'm testing this. But later on, people change their configuration deployment. I don't know about it, and then things break and if i'm doing greasing on one tenth of one percent of connections eh, 
you know, TLS failures happen. Network really, you know, just like network connectivity failures happen all the time. Absolutely. IPv2 VPN failures are pretty common. We'll just retry automatically in the background. No one's ever going to notice. So is there a threshold? I mean, there's so certainly... there, uh, oh. David Ben had a really neat idea, which unfortunately he never got around to implementing. We were thinking in Chrome that uh, like the seed for greasing would be every Chrome instance has a random number that's fixed. And then you hash that number with like the origin and that gives you your seed for uh, for greasing. And so you can refresh as many times as you want. You always get a, the same numbers, but like you're the next person next to you actually doesn't. Oh, horrible. <laughs> the, the, the user experience on that is absolutely horrible. Because then and, one and, person and, is stuck and, and no one else in the world get, is stuck. And you get support saying, works for me, you're an idiot. <laughs> okay. And and that's the problem, right? I mean, I mean, I went through this with a with a with one uh, with my DNS guys. Uh, the registrar uh, wouldn't work. Wouldn't work. PayPal not working. PayPal not working. They finally said, "Could you try with Firefox?" And I agreed to do that. And uh, all sorts like back and forth. They, you know, all debug logs from Chrome and whatever, and all that. The the what is that? There's a special file format that has the whole thing which i'd never heard of before yeah net log and uh, no it's something else but anyway par. um pardon me par H -A -R? yeah maybe that's it anyway it's supposed to anyway it, record you can record the thing firefox and and chrome will record all the stuff back and forth yeah. and um anyway uh, all that stuff they can reproduce it they can't figure out what i'm busy pointing to what about this load that doesn't really work here and they don't think it's relevant. And anyway, I don't think they fixed it yet. But, but um, as I said, we we it works for us on the same platform with the same version on the same thing. And I'm like, you know, what am I supposed to do now? Right, as you say. Yeah. Um, Lucas, since you're here and to call on you, you know, I I've done a lot of quick testing against you in your servers. I mean. The Cloudflare servers always send some greased uh, code points, right? During the handshake, because they're small enough. Uh, hi, uh, my my mic's been playing up all week, so I don't know how good or bad this quality is. You're good. Uh, You're good. It's it's okay. Okay. Um. Yeah. So this is like I think. Uh, sorry, I was late as well, so I've missed stuff. I apologize if I'm repeating things that have already been discussed. Um. I think, you know, the, the H2 ship has kind of sailed without the greasing. And that's sad. And the, um, I was even this week, I was minding some of the good work that the, the folks over at Google and Chrome did. Um, we spoke with Bents back in, he was doing some experiments there and he thought there was some problem we had. I think maybe we did and we fixed something pretty quick, but then it was, it was something else, whatever. Um, so very early in the, the HP3 implementation, like we, we kind of chose to um, just send grease all the time like it, it, it was easy when we were doing interop you know sat around a hackathon and someone's like what the heck what's going on here um and that was mainly around this basic implementation bug uh because of whatever but um and it was always something i've considered like yeah maybe maybe i could just turn it off now um but actually just leaving it in is, is i think fine do it for everything the tls one i'm not so sure i don't know if that's maybe a boring ssl uh Kind of opinionated matter um need someone else more familiar with the tls stuff to, to say whether or not uh but yeah like just do stuff i think what, what maybe like it's easy to send it's hard to detect from a, a server operational perspective like the um uh what's the word finding out when you've caused those kind of handshake problems like is kind of tricky there's network error logging. Some of those things can sort of help, but uh, especially with quick, even the granularity of them isn't brilliant. And like you said, Tommy, like there's so many other reasons that things can fail. Um, you know, we just talked about ha, but like uh, I, I'm, I'm deep in months worth of discussions with the customer support people at Cloudflare because they ask people to collect HARs because they think it includes everything, but it, it generally doesn't include any of the information that I would find useful to debug stuff. Um, cause the, the 
most of the bugs have been fixed, which is great. But a lot of the ones that are under my remit, like H2 flow control, HP3, whatever's, are like really, really hard to find. I don't expect people to be able to know what's going on. The manifestation of the problems is weird. Um, you know, even this week, uh, I was working with a colleague to look at curls behavior when I like somebody did a post upload um, where a response came back at a certain point in time. It wasn't a race condition, but it's a timing kind of thing. And, and they, 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 they were doing this to, to fix something else. And they did just a test with curl because, you know, everyone uses curl and it's fine. And it wasn't meeting our expectations. I was like, maybe this is a bugging curl. They wouldn't believe me because it's curl. <laughs> but, you know, because we know people, you speak to some of the maintainers like Daniel and Stefan, and it turned out Stefan had stumbled on this last week. It's, it's some behavior that been in curl for forever. And the fix is easy enough. Um, they knew exactly what to do. But finding finding these things is um, is really hard. So I know that's not specifically about greeting, but so go on. I actually had a, a, a HTTP2 bug with curl with the uh, internet draft submission thing that I reported to Robert Sparks that's going through obviously Cloudflare. And of course it worked with 1.1. One, one. Um, so I, don't know, I was just thinking like, maybe I actually experienced that bug. Um, so, you know, whatever. If you got, if you got Did, I was gonna ask you that I, I, yeah, I don't really know what happened except that I got an error. Um, uh, uh, but I wondered, does the Jeff Houston method of, you know, zero pixel loading and scanning and stuff like that, does that, have you ever tried that kind of stuff to see if this works or maybe you, we should contract Jeff to do that? Do you know what I'm talking about? Jeff Houston has done a whole bunch of surveys of things where he, uh, DNS sec resolution, whether you accept uh, broken name servers, um uh penetration of http2 um all sorts of stuff by having by displaying ads to uh, zero pixel ads to people right and he measures whether or not they load um and i think he has javascript on i can't remember which side he does the job some things but he measures things yeah it's an i mean it, it doesn't doesn't hurt but i think I mean, the the point I generally get pulled in is that it's it's like a really hard to find bug, and, and maybe even something the protocol was unclear about on what to do and stuff like. But basic connectivity, yeah, sometimes. But then we get into the issues of like, well, as a as a big uh, cloud infrastructure provider, we're not really responsible for the content in any way. So then, um, where where do those reports go? What are they revealing about the the people who use our services and users, uh, should we even know any of that? So like some of this stuff is difficult. The things in um, privacy preserving metrics and, and things like that um, are super interesting for this. Um, and I know other people are working on those things like for Chris Wood, for instance, um, kind of looking at maybe how network error logging could be made slightly more anonymous or whatever. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It just it gets to the point where, you know, um, even even me, I I thought I found a bug in 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 Chrome like six months ago, but I wasn't sure. And the only way really was to get a very specific reproduction with all of the error logging and analysis and graphing, and to say to somebody, I think it's here, and then they had the expertise of Chrome's internals to say, oh yeah, um, that is a bug. Thanks. Um, Without that, you know, it's just impossible to reproduce anything. I think this is it. You, you might even agree that there's a problem somewhere, but if you can't reproduce something, uh, like how are, you, how are you gonna fix it? Um, and know that you haven't regressed. Like you need to develop a test uh, even to, to kind of exhibit that weirdness of behavior. Where we get into the point of like, should something like curl behave 100% to the protocol compliance? maybe by default, but actually you need all of the toggles to force bad behavior um, in order to test that things on the other side are, are kind of reacting in the, um, appropriately. Are they, do they ignore that? Do they, are they liberal or are they very specific? Are they gonna generate error codes and send them? Um, th th these paths are less trodden in that respect. You might even do it, implement that, like, as you want, 
but because you don't exercise that code ever in practice, then it breaks and whoops. Um, I, I'll give an example as well. Like recently, we we're informed of some behavior within within our um, Quicken HB3 layer. And, and it was it was kind of around greasing and extension frames. Like I said, I was I knew about this stuff when I was doing the implementation, but some unique sequence of events meant if you sent an extension frame at a certain point in time during the entire HP request response exchange, uh, some something failed, and it kind of timed out, and that's that's annoying. Without automated testing. Um, I don't think we could have caught that until we got a user who was able to be bothered to even spend the time to look into it a bit more and then report the thing. Um, I, I was also seeing on the chat, David, you were bringing up MLS as another protocol, asking questions about. Um, I think it's an interesting question of like, you know, should we get stuff in there you want to bring yeah, that to I the mean, recording just, you know i, I was here. just thinking like what are the protocols that are happening these days that i know about and mls is top of mind because i've been talking with ad's about it quite a lot lately um <clears throat> but one of the things it does i just pulled it up and pulled the ina consideration section up and i was like oh they have eight new registries and no greasing that's probably something that we can ask them to add without them being sad given but it is an isg review already martin that's fine. martin i already made that request and there was a long discussion about it i was just trying to find the the issue mm. uh, if i find ah. the issue i will i will put it in the chat just give me a minute did people say it, no it it actually like lucas went just like kind of indicates to me that maybe we should put more effort into um testing in the first place rather than like i think greasing is just covering kind of the tip of the iceberg where you can like catch some of the obvious cases but you don't catch all the other problems well but if we, we can't say let's not do anything because we can't fix all the problems right it is a tool that we can have and we should use if we think it's a good tool we should use it so the, so the reason why greasing is is important is that not everyone implements the same day and not everyone gets to go to the 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 hackathons and the bake-offs and whatever. And sometimes the implementation is five years later and you can't even find the people you want to interoperate with, you know, XYZ uh, product. Uh, the people that built, that wrote it, aren't even at XYZ anymore. Um, so even if you went to an ITF and met all the right people and they said, oh yeah, yeah, I can give you a debug version that tells you what you're doing wrong or something like this um, or enables this. Um, we actually need that to kind of be available out there uh, on a regular basis to surprise uh, people who are writing new code um, and to go, oh, and I actually think that I like this, bu this business that, that uh, you know, the IANA considerations actually should have a subsection called greasing and that if it's not there, um, you should say why, right? Um, and one answer is, oh, we, you know, it's a, a four bit code point and we couldn't possibly afford one for greasing, okay? Um, and that's, you know, not uh, an unfortunate situation, but um, not crazy. Um, and then, you know, if there's some private use space, then to me, that is actually kind of almost begging for, you know, allocating a couple of them for greasing. Um, one of the problems in, for instance, Ike V1, for instance, we had all this private use space, but we didn't know whose private use space it was. And we went to some uh, conniptions, right? So we had all these people throwing extensions in there and we had to qualify that with a vendor. And that was a, something we did yeah. very early on, right? And I think that was a good thing. Um, but not everyone understood what was going on. And there were implementations where, you know, you would say, I'm vendor foo, here's my private number. And it would go, oh yeah, you're using that private number. Oh, I'm using it for, to mean this, but it's not formatted right. Oops, fail. And so that was an example of, of greasing with unintentional greasing, um, but they got it wrong, right? I mean, they just didn't check the qualifications of the private use number. Um, and um, so that's why I think it has to be there regularly. And I would really love to have every document have some kind of statement about, you know, how that yeah. works. Talking about MLS, 
I have a different question. If they have like eight extension points, is that the right? Is that right? Like, do we need eight extension points? Eight What's the right points. number? I, I didn't look at this in detail, but this is also a question that I've been looking at at quick, for example, like how, when I extend the protocol, what's the right way to do it? When do I use a new quick version? When do I use a new parameter? When do I use whatever? So for mm -hmm. MLS, they're not necessarily all extension points. They're like cipher suites and signature schemes, kind of like TLS. It, it makes sense for what they're doing. But, but it's a good point still, like you have a lot of, I mean, a cipher suite list is a form of extension point. It's not for arbitrary extensions, but it is a list that presumably will grow and it has private use reserve cipher suite code points. Um, I mean, you certainly could grease it and you could certainly have ossification with implementations that are like barfing if they ever see a cipher suite that they don't recognize as one of the things that's being offered. Makes sense. I think there's more than just throwing in random extra code points into your implementations. Uh, as we've discovered with TLS, ordering matters. If you can have variable ordering, uh, values of different parameters can matter as well. It, it can be the case that you have a protocol that, that most people exercise only a small, small part of the value space of a particular parameter and you set a set that value to something large and people choke. Uh, I, I tend to think that the, the, the universe of, of possible failure modes is, is much greater than the, the set where we're setting yourself, ourselves up to, to test here. Yeah, that's definitely a good point. Um, and you know, we certainly can do things in the initial definitions of protocols, like allocate things in the registry saying you should switch the order. Um, but we can also say things separately and afterwards, like, you know, like maybe doing the code point reservation is something that's nice to have just so that those things exist, but you know, the strategies for greasing TLS could be a separate document. Strategies for greasing MLS could be its own thing. Like, I mean, they don't need to necessarily be in the core protocol, also. Um, there are ways you use it. Yeah, I think there's, there's sort of a, a very important question. Um, regarding how how you sort of work through these problems i think we've we're greasing quick transport parameters but my assertion would be that we don't need to <laughs> we're 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 greasing a bunch of other things in quick and we probably don't need to grease those things it's the other things that we need to grease and this, this i think comes back to the the protocol maintenance uh, question. Uh, when when things break, um, how quickly can you detect that they're broken is, is part of the reason why you do greasing, I think. Um, but also, what happens next? And it seems like um, HTTP2 is a great example of, well, what happens next is you decide that you can't continue to operate using the, that particular style of of use uh we, we just don't give up what happens next after what after after you find the problem so you you, oh, you find the problem and you discover that you can't use this, this this extension mechanism anymore what do you do at that point and it might just be that there's like one implementation that you can send them an email or, or what have you or you know it's endemic and you have to find a, a new way to extend the protocol uh, i think the the reaction to what we've done in HTTP2 is to to use the sort of settings which which are reasonably available, and you sort of negotiate the use of the extension. Thanks, David. I think that's great. It's probably too late. You're going to get a sorry, David. It's too late. Yeah, that's that's what. Which is fine. 
but you know at least I, i'd rather say it and have them tell me no than them tell me you know after it's published oh you should have told us um did it did it finish itf last call already uh, yeah, yeah it's it's under isg review that's why uh, ad's are bat well, balloting strangely we, we just need we just need to get some you, you just tell someone on isg to add it to the comments <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's still open there's no one on the isg on this call but we have more yeah, but i'm not allowed to spell it but you can can you can forward something to the rest of the ISG and find a we yeah you know, we've had um we've had ads on here before we've had Eric and others so we can just say yo I mean I can pick up a phone and ask someone to put a discuss but I don't no, want to be that me. guy just add a comment you can't right. you can't put a discuss anymore too late just just add a comment yeah um. Anyway, so, given that it doesn't so, change so, so, the protocol, so, it just changes the registry that hasn't been created. I think they might be open to it, but whatever. I just reserve for the bots. Yeah. Yeah. So Miriam's point, I think, is one that we make in the use it or lose it draft. And if if you're if you have five extension points and you you think you can get by with one, one is probably a better choice because the that one is more likely to get the use that it's uh, that's necessary to to keep it active. Yeah, but then if that... one breaks, right? You're completely lost. Oh, of course. Oh, yeah. Come well, on. so Come maybe on. two is the right number. Oh, <laughs> there's always no, another no, no, one further up, right? In yeah. in in right. most cases, there's always another New one. Protocol number. New protocol. <laughs> My PV seven. Whoops. It's one of yeah. the extension points in IP, right? Yeah, it, it's also an ossified one. So it's kind of mm. a joke. But the next protocol would be new IP then. <laughs> I'm holding off for IPv10. Someone had to say it. There was <sighs> a proposal for IPv16, which is like, doesn't even fit in existing extension. Right. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. but actually, uh, to to agree i think like someone has have been some folks have been calling it langley's law which is you know have one joint and oil it well and if you have one extension joint and you're forced to use it like you know let's say transport parameters you're forced to send transport parameters and to parse them to be able to establish a connection you're guaranteed that that joint won't rust shut to some extent um which is kind of nice yeah, I'm wondering I know right now we have this IEP document on like your protocol should be extendable, right? But I'm not sure if it gives any guidance about how many extension points you need or whatever. I would need to look it up. Do you mean use it or lose it? No, there is a document um, which is basically the main advice is like if you design a protocol, it should be extensible. Um, which are you talking about? This is Dave Taylor wrote this document like a few years ago. I don't know the name. Oh, I see. Oh, an RFC. Yes, an IAB RFC, yes. Okay, okay, okay. So I thought we found out. Um, which, which one is this? Uh, let me look it up. I think I uh, we referenced it in protocol maintenance. Yeah, yeah. 67 out of 9. I got it mixed yeah. up with 67 61, which is another one by similar people. Mm -hmm. Well, that's Stuart. Yeah. 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 I know that one by. <laughs> yeah. Does it? So does that one talk about how many? Hmm. I think so. I think the main message would be like, if you design a protocol, you need to have it extensible. Well, yeah, it, so... it's uh, yeah. D define the extension and don't do the TLS thing of, hey, we magically made it work and. Uh, and and here's why uh, that wasn't great. Yeah. Yeah, but the the extensibility shortcomings of earlier versions of of TLS sort of has turned into this attitude in TLS where everything gets an extension point, and mm. that isn't necessarily a better place to be. Right. Yep. Uh, 
SNI anyone? Well, I'm, well, I'm thinking more like how many people are out there using extensions in their certificate request message. Yeah, I know what I'm saying. In SNI, there's the field of like, is this a host name or something else? And you cannot use any thumb something else. Like it's broken. Um, the the other thing that I was thinking about this week, even before this meeting, which is a weird coincidence, I saw this in the calendar somewhere. But um, the the whole thing with like extension, well, frames in HTTP two, as an example, is where you have some intermediary between the client, like a browser that you're trying to speak to and the server that you're trying to send a frame from, and that frames are hop by hop. So even if the intermediary does things like throw the unknown extension on the floor, it doesn't pass it on, even if the intermediary would need to do anything with that. And that um, some of the attempts we're trying to do with greasing, maybe don't run the full chain because of that, if that makes sense. like. The setting greasing would maybe. I mean, the intermediary can always drop things if they want, but the way that the, the the specification is written is that you know you ignore an unknown frame. Um, you don't pass it through in order to kind of grease the whole chain. I don't know if we have to do anything there, but it it did seem a funny situation yeah. I hadn't considered before. I mean, I, yes, you have, Lucas, and that's how we ended up with capsules. <laughs> like, like literally, the original version was an H2 and H3 frame, where the entire definition was just forward and along if you're an intermediary. Um, yeah, fun times. Um, so being cognizant of time, we have seven minutes left. Um, I did want to come back to one of the questions I'd mentioned early on, just to see if we have any opinions here of, you know, as we are doing greasing and things like quick and, you know, Martin, you were mentioning, I think rightly that like there are places where we're greasing that, yeah, we probably didn't need to. Um, but in other cases where we are greasing and it's not as obvious that it is being used, how do we, how do we know it is working? Um, like, at what point is this not just a futile effort where we're defining, oh, you have all these code points, but maybe no one's using it or maybe they're using it, but it's not actually effective enough. Uh, we brought up the ideas that you know, maybe you're not greasing often enough to make it noticeable to users. Ah. How do we start approaching that problem? For another 10 years. What? Wait for another 10 years and then figure out where we are. <laughs> so greasing has to be avail has to be reported to users. Um, they have to be able to ask for greasing. Most users won't do this, but that's what, you know, semi-technical users are going to do. So we need to know that part. We need that information. Um, what do you mean ask for it? I should be able to go into some button and say, please grease this connection. Because yeah. the person who reported to me that it was broken had a little notification that said it broke while I was greasing. The problem is you can never know that it's the greasing that caused the problem. Of it's course like... I can't know that, right? Of course. But at least I should be able to test the same scenario. So if that means that the greasing is happening based upon some pseudo-random cookie, then that cookie needs to be visible so that I can plug it into a new browser and reproduce the problem, right? I mean, that is a UI problem, but we can put requirements on that uh, UI even if we're people think we're not allowed to design them. Um, so that's 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 one thing. The second thing is that we might actually need to have some kind of a logging or reporting mechanism uh, that allows uh, um, greasing to become visible in logs or something like this um, so that um, you know entities like Cloudflare could actually go and collect greasing and from greasing results from a wide variety of different products, right? 
Um, sounds like a lot, but I mean, if we're serious about it, I think it's important. And and then I think we should we need to to get Jeff Houston into a cloning factory and make more of him. Anyone else have thoughts on how we could know if it's useful or if we're doing enough? Uh, um, a related but probably separate problem is also about how do we get actually better logging in cases of failure, right? How do we can, can we get better measurements? Which is like what Lucas was saying earlier. Yeah. yeah. And like that would include also information about squeezing, I would say. Yeah. Um, I mean, to ask the question as a French person who likes cooking with butter, is there such a thing as too much grease? Um, as in, is there ever a case where you were like, maybe should I grease, should I not? And then you don't, you do, and you're like, you know, I shouldn't have. Like I, I see MT's point that like there are cases where maybe wasn't necessary, but it definitely didn't hurt. Yeah, I, I, I'm not suggesting that it, it, it's not something that um, we shouldn't do in those cases where, where we think it would help in that way. Um, there are cases where it's not going to be very helpful. Uh, in the IoT case where you, you cause fragmentation by blowing the packet up multiple times, you, you're probably introducing an unacceptable performance hit. And if you only do it under the special mode that Michael suggests, then we're in a situation where um, no one's going to use it and it's not going to not going to find the bugs when you, when you need it to uh, but on the on the other hand I, I i think we need to be sort of cognizant of the fact that this has limitations and those limitations are we're testing a very specific set of bugs in a very specific way and protocol implementations get lots and lots of other problems and just by closing off this particular type of problem, we're not necessarily sort of addressing the sort of whole suite of ways in which protocol implementations can start to break down. You know, the state machine problems, the, the value range problems, the um, all, all of the sorts of intermediary things like, the, like Lucas is referring to, all of those sorts of things tend to um, tend to require different approaches to find them and I, I think we we can sort of overly fixate on one particular type of bug it's a very very well known bug and a very common one I think I was shocked at how fast people managed to replicate this bug in the new protocol um, and <laughs> we continue to be shocked um, we should just not build extension points into protocols if that's if this is the way people are going to go. I just but... wanted to say the, the opposite kind of. I think like keeping extension points alive and, and usable is a very important point for a protocol. But the better method to get this done is to actually use the extension point rather than just squeeze it. Sure. Well, that's that's kind of the key point of the of the RFC on the topic, but um, um, yeah. but. I mean, I guess, Martin, to your point that there are different types of problems, like like ordering or values, like there are things where you can do where I, I can use an extension point a lot, but if I do it always in the same way and everyone always puts things in the same order, even if they're not required to have in the same order, then someone comes along, puts them in a different order, then they can break in weird ways. Like we could also have a false sense of security um, and we probably need to level up our discussion of greasing to more than just allocated code points and talk about all of these behavioral behavioral greasing. Um, yeah, but I, the sorts of things like that are that. interesting, are, um, even though I said said don't inflate the packet size, we're going to need to inflate the packet size in, in quick because we're going to find that this post-quantum apocalypse comes along yep. and we need some new algorithms and they tend to be grossly inefficient ones. So um, we'll find out at that point. It would be nice if we could find out a little bit ahead of time, but it's very hard to anticipate the sorts of problems that you might encounter in the future based on um, requirements that you haven't anticipated today. So, yeah. yeah. Sure. 
how much All right, like um, just just one one quick comment like how much is the spectrum between greasing and like doing more greasing versus like just fuzzing like to the point where you're just tweaking every variable under the sun uh whether it's an extension or not uh just this is a very big slope i think yeah i don't think we have very many implementations that sort of actively fuzz within the envelope of something that works most fuzzers sort of set themselves up to to just like run it break it run it break it run it break it right um but but fuzzing certainly has an, app, an application in the protocol layer very much not normally right uh it depends mm -hmm. i think we do have some of that depending on the protocol my experience with fuzzing is that mostly they just make just they just uh ran put random garbage and keep ra permuting the random garbage um until they see something break it's not very efficient that way it would be you know much more informed to you know format things in once you've tested that the the length parameter in the tlv is not susceptible then you're wasting your time making things that don't have valid type length things right um and you, you it's very hard to get that in a generic fashion um and often the fuzzers don't even know what they broke when they break something yeah so uh, our tls fuzzer was set up with very specific permutations on valid handshakes so that we could avoid the sort of um filtering that happens by throwing out random garbage uh, and i i don't know if we did a reordering one but potentially well, i'd have to go and ask um, I mean, yeah we, we do 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 fuzzing i don't know whether we reorder things most of the stuff we're doing doesn't have enough structure to it to reorder actually yeah yeah all right uh we are over time and i'm gonna need to drop um now so thank you all i'll uh stop this recording and i think uh if people are okay, we can kind of continue the discussion at the next idea. Sounds good. Thanks, everyone, and see you in Japan. Yeah. Bye. Bye.